introducing the one and only Ben Stowe. Yeah, baby. <laughs> yeah. Hey, good evening and welcome to the Great White North. <laughs> yeah, it's still. It is. <laughs> It just is. The winter that I'm ready, never... for, I'm ready for the great green north. I mean, enough of it. This is ridiculous, you know? So, as you may notice, this is not Ben Stowe's basement that we're broadcasting from tonight. This is a different location, but still well within his snow belt for tonight's snowstorm. Yes, I'm actually, I might even actually be even closer to Canada than usual, uh, which yeah. is why I'm in my hotel room and I'm wearing a fleece. So yes. it, but at least, you know, it's on brand here. Yeah, right? it looks good. It looks good. Yeah, he's, you, but, uh, he's repping and ready to roll for tonight's show, which of course, tonight we're talking about electricity. And, and there's, there's so many questions that pop up with this one when it comes to, to powering gear and lights and things. And that has evolved over the years from the time of when we first started to where we are today. And we're going to dig into a lot of those questions. But really, in order, whenever you're talking about electricity, I don't know if you can really do an electricity show without talking about one of the biggest developments in electricity that happened in our lifetime, which would have happened back in 1985. When Doc Brown was able to take, harness the power of a lightning bolt and put it into the DeLorean and send Marty back to the future. I think yeah, that probably, uh, as far as scientific achievement goes, that probably ranks right up there, yeah. So, so my question, Ben, is electricity, generally you have to close, you have to make a circuit, complete a circuit to make it work properly, don't you? Well, you do. Um, and and I, I think if you're about to ask how he did that, I mean, I think we're talking about some some nuanced things here, and probably also talking about some Hollywood, right? Oh, you there's know, the, the, that it was real. Well, other than yeah, other the than flux that. capacitor. I mean, everyone who's got one is is traveling, time traveling. I mean, uh, that's that's true. Uh, so my future self has told me, uh, but. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, I mean, lightning, you know, already exists uh, in a circuit. It's it's in essence the uh, equalization of electrical potentials between the you know ground and the cloud, you know. So it's just a matter of being there when lightning strikes. Right. Uh, that's that's obviously, you know, what Doc Brown was going for is knowing where to be exactly when to be there uh, so that when lightning strikes the uh, clock tower, you, you know, they mm. they could use it to generate the energy sufficient 1.21 gigawatts i think to uh to go back to the future 1955 yeah, i think it was 55 and yeah back to the 80s yes, yeah. and back but because i think doesn't a delorean get sent to 2025 too so it's going to show up here in another year or so yeah I, I, i'm pretty excited about that myself still waiting for the hoverboards though or those <sighs> you know we can't have everything but maybe that's on that's that one. Interesting, uh, you know, talking about electricity, that's an interesting thing to think about. Um, so you got 1.21 gigawatts, which is approximately, uh, well, it'd be exactly 1,210 megawatts, just to make it a little bit more um, digestible, mm -hmm. I guess, in, in, you know, a term we use a lot when we talk about electrical transmission and generation is megawatt. So you've got 1.21 times 10 to the ninth power, could this could this happen? Could this be done? You know, so let's take uh, lightning is um, call it three hundred million volts, uh, which would be uh, so yeah three hundred million volts, and uh, of course using Ohm's law we know there's a relationship between volts, amps, and watts. Mm -hmm. So uh, in order to calculate watts, which is what our megawatts are, our, giga, our, our gigawatts or gigawatts, depending how you want to say it. So we've got uh, power equals amperage times voltage. But we also have to factor uh, the relationship of resistance here. Yes. So Because we, we don't know. We have 300 million volts available to us, but we don't know how we're going to get that delivered. So we've got, uh, we've got current equals um, volts divided by resistance. Um, and I, I would guess now this was in 85. Yes. Well, actually, technically Doc Brown was using 1955 wires and technology and connectors. So in 55 transmission lines, I don't really know the answer to this, but in, in 50, my good friend, Mark Scheibe probably would. He's, he works for, a, uh, he's, he's, manages <laughs> a power cooperative. He's, the, he's the CEO of a power cooperative, but I would guess in the 50s, probably most of your transmission lines were copper. But if I remember correctly from the movie, 
uh, that looked more like a just like a steel wire rope. It kind of did itself, and then the end of it had uh, two big copper contacts. So when you plugged the pieces in, so uh, steel is not nearly as good a conductor as copper. Uh, and I think we remember we see the wire rope on fire. Yes, but it doesn't, it doesn't melt. Right, it mm -hmm. stays intact. Yes, it just has so, light, like the little. Yes, singe, flame, whatever, and then goes away. So steel melts at about 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, and copper melts at a little less than 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. But the fusing temperature for copper is many more amps than steel. Uh, copper can carry more electricity before melting than steel can because it's a better conductor. Mm -hmm. So if this was steel... Um, and of course, we talked about our Ohm's law and our relationship between, you know, resistance and, uh, you know, amps and volts and, and power. Um, I don't really know what the fusing amperage for uh, steel would be. I would guess probably a little bit better than iron, which is around 700, I think. Uh, so let's see. Let's work this out. So if we've got 300 million volts available to us. And we've got some certain amount of resistance from this steel wire rope. And let's assume that it's roughly the equivalent of like a 2 aught or a 3 aught. although we don't use American wire gauge to measure ferrous metals like iron. So we're just sort of thinking about the, you know, rough same diameter here. Yep. And we've got to get to uh, 1.21 gigawatts, so which is 1.21 times 10 to the ninth power. Um, we have our lightning, which is 300 million uh, volts, which is uh, 3 times 10 to the 8th power. So we could divide that. Uh, we would only need 4 amps of current at 300 million volts, assuming, assuming it could all be delivered. But we also have a question of time. You know, uh, we, we probably have to think about, you know, joules here. So, but... We know that that wire would be able to handle the amperage without melting, assuming it only carried the load to power the DeLorean. Mm -hmm. But again, the lightning is getting discharged into all kinds of places. But on the other hand, we also see the wire burning at the end. And I would guess that you've got this tremendous amount of heat generated by the lightning, which has probably caused anything on the wire, impurities, grease, anything from this wire being laying around. You know, it's, that's probably what's burning. That's okay. probably impurities in the wire that are probably burning, I think. So I think there's probably some solid science here that suggests you probably can use a lightning bolt to power a DeLorean if you can find one and get it to go 88 miles an hour and hit it exactly, exactly. in the right place at the time. Uh, but I have, to, I have to go watch the movie now. I, I yeah, it, it, it started watching. Things you do in a hotel on the road. I don't know. I just sit here and think about a movie I haven't seen in, in a long time. A long God, time. It's been a minute. Yeah. So, hey, viewers, if any of you are more up on any of this and I'm wrong about the uh, approximate diameter or type of the wire or uh, the melting temperatures of anything, I'm going, I'm, 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 I'm working from thumb sketch math here. So uh, put in the comments. Uh, I don't know. It seems... It seems plausible to me. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. it's, I think that if you had 300 million volts available to you, you could probably sufficiently deliver four amps of current. I mean, if a Mr. Fusion can do it, uh, you know, you know, if some colored burning logs can do it, uh, I, I feel like a lightning bolt could probably do probably it. Probably get us there. Get us there. And now we're also assuming that we need the entirety of the power delivered by the lightning because the car also has power. No, that that is true. It did have it did have a level of power as it was going down the road. Sure. Yeah. So. Okay. So, now I have a question for you, John. Mm hmm. What does this have to do with the DJ? Well, because there are times where we feel like we are needing to have that lightning strike to be able to run all of our gear. And yeah, today yet, at my event, in fact. Uh, <laughs> I, so sorry to interrupt, but yeah. We have feeders, right, which we have two-aught copper feeders, three-phase, five-wire going into a distribution panel. And on the disconnect of the panel, there is a safety switch. If you open the access to where the feeders are tied in, since it's bare wire tied into uh, lugs, mm -hmm. it will trip the circuit. And wouldn't you know it, right in the middle of one of the presenters, 
the entire stage goes dark. I watch 200 amps of power go out simultaneously, and I'm like, okay, that's at the distribution level. That's mm -hmm. There's nothing individual that tripped here. That is, I lost every single bit of power I had. Now, my consoles and things stayed up because they're on battery backups, but I saw the entire stage go out. Sure. Video wall, projectors, lights, speakers. Sure enough, some electrician opened the wrong panel and killed my show. So... The worst part is the panel was locked shut. They had to get a key to do it. And like, at that point, you probably should have checked. Hey, are these wires coming out of here? So I could have used some lightning. You could have. Oh, I could have used some lightning. So that would have kept it going, and you would have gotten to 1985. It would have been great. What are the odds? Uh, uh, the, yeah, the electrician would have got to 1985. But yeah, what are the odds that... Uh, what are the odds that that would happen on a day we're doing a power show? No, oh, that's funny. That's funny. So you mentioned, of course, uh, basically going in and and directly into the board. Uh, now, there's a couple of different ways. You're doing it at a level that's way beyond 99.9% .9 of the the people that, uh, that, you know, mobile DJs or DJs who do even small production. They're not going to do what you just did with with their their electrical needs but there are times i've i've heard of djs who are going in and utilizing a um, a bigger uh power uh, distribution device that is using 220 or like a uh, 220 uh, volt system sure um for those who are just not familiar with the differences between you know the the 110 220 and uh and and beyond uh kind of give us a a, a little quick overview of what those different voltages in our world are about well i'm smiling because i'm remembering the show better off dead where he says uh, oh, are you wiring it with 220 and the, i think the reply is uh two, since we're talking about you know 80s movie nostalgia here but you know he says uh 220 221 whatever it takes you know so uh <laughs> i think it's uh, i think that was the movie i think it was better off dead anyway if i'm wrong about that put in the i don't care i don't even care honestly but uh, you know what? I'm going to, I, I have uh, presented on power a few times and I have a PowerPoint uh, about power that I am going to nice. pull up here because I have some slides where I think this is going to be much easier to demonstrate visually uh, if we could. Yeah. So let me think how I want to go about this. Uh, let me start here with a color code. Uh, and then I'm going to show a receptacle. Yeah, I think I'm just going to, I'm going to do what I've got here. And then I think you can, uh, yeah, we'll, 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 uh, work our way through. That'll be great. Yeah. All right. So let me just try this and you can tell me if it's coming up. Okay. Yep. That's what I'm kind of waiting for here to okay. see where we are and to see if I want to change us to a different, there we go. Okay. We're, we're good. Okay, so uh, basically, what you see here is kind of a basic electrical color code. Uh, looks like it's <laughs> looks like PowerPoint changed my colors on the right, but that's okay. We're not going to pay attention to those, so don't worry about those for now. Uh, the ones on the left are what is important here. Um, so pay no attention to the ones on the right. This is it's an old PowerPoint, mm -hmm. and it's probably formatted weird. I, I can see my fonts aren't lining up either. So yeah. you know what? Uh, this was unexpected. So just go with it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm talking to the viewers. I know you will, but, you know, saying. Okay, so uh, anybody who's ever looked at a, uh, a an extension cord or the wiring in their house is going to recognize the first three colors in our color uh, here, uh, you know, color code here. Uh, green, of course, for ground. White is our neutral. Uh, and then black is our hot conductor. That's typically what we call it. Um, now, in three phase, we've got three hot conductors, and you can see them identified here as one, two, and three. And you'll notice on the left-hand side, it says this is for 120, 208, and 240, um, which probably immediately has some people confused. Saying, exactly. Well, how can it, yeah, how can it be for all three? So let's take a look. So uh, this is a NEMA uh, 1450, which is a very common uh, for, you know, uh, bars and, and, you know, small venues that have some type of a distro connect. Uh, you know, it, I guess in common parlance, we call it a dryer plug, mm -hmm. you know, and this is going to give me 50 amps uh, single phase at, uh, at 240 volts, which is the same as 100 amps at 120 volts. So here's how it breaks down. Uh, there's my ground. There's my neutral. There is the hot we talked about. So, right. Okay. But we're going to add another hot here. So we've got two hots, a neutral, and a ground. Sure. 
And the connection between the hots, if we make a connection between those two, that's 240 volts. If we make a connection between the neutral and either hot, that's 120 volts, which is what most of our gear utilizes. So there's our utilization. Uh, and then, of course, between the uh, hot phases and the uh, ground, if we have a good ground connection, that should always be the same as neutral. And, of course, we should have zero volts between the ground and the neutral. Uh, so uh, taking a look at how this would connect to uh, my outlets here. So here we see some standard NEMA 515 receptacles like you would find in your wall. That's what these uh, yellow lines here represent. Sure. Okay. Hopefully everybody can get along with this diagram. Yeah, well, no, we're doing well. Mm-hmm. Uh, just picture what you'd see in your wall. So here's how the wiring might look, right? We've got both of our grounds. Uh, we've got both of our neutrals. Uh, and then this one's going to get one of our hots, and this one's going to get another one of our hots. So each leg of our power is going to go to 120 amp uh, service, if you will. So that's 240. Uh, and so we can see that 120, 240 is the same thing. Uh, what's also... Uh, a thing and probably harder to wrap your head around is that 120 208 are the same thing. Hmm. And this is uh, this is where it gets a little bit more advanced because now we start talking about three phase. We start talking about well, when we talk about phase, you know, and when I'm talking about audio, I like to say that phase is just a fancy word for time, and it really kind of is the same thing here with electricity. We start talking about the angle of the phase. So uh, here is a three phase disconnect. This is similar to what I'm using today. And you can see that those colors exist here, my green, my black, and my white. And yeah. then I've added my other two phases, my red and my blue. And this is why probably, you know, it's not one of those things that if you, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, you should stay out of here because you can get vaporized. Yeah. Uh, you know, but that these are very large conductors. Uh, so there's tremendous uh, current carrying capability, but also, of course, there are, you're making direct connections to you know potentially live parts now we always make sure they're dead parts before we connect to them uh, or else you could become a dead part mm -hmm. but anyway um so this is what that disconnect looks like in the three-phase world as it as it were and know? that's the that's the type of a connection that uh, the person opened up today and and basically shut off at the show for you Correct. Uh, now, these uh, cables here have these connector ends on them, these rubber booted ends that just plug in. Mm -hmm. But many times we're doing what I did today, which is connecting a bare tail right into the panel. Okay. And, and for obvious reasons, when that panel opens, in this case, this panel can't open while this is in the switch is in the on position. So the panel is using today looks a little bit different and okay. it has a switch safety. Anyway, the moral of the story is when you open the panel, the power goes out. Mm hmm. And the show comes to a screeching halt. And so, then, yeah, then your stage is done. did that? I don't know, but you should never do that. I mean, my goodness, you, you know, you can't miss the giant bundle of wires coming out the bottom of it. But anyway, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not bitter about it. No, yes, no, I no. You're, I'm, I'm, you're taking it very well. I must say. Yeah. I, yeah. Usa. Usa. All right. Moving on. So. Here's how we uh, would make this work, and then we'll get into our angles of uh, phase in a minute. So grounds like we saw before, mm -hmm. neutrals like we saw before, and then my three hot phases, and that all becomes 120. Easy enough. Yeah. So where does the 208 come in? And this is all now basically single phase that we're looking at. We've just got three single phases. So what are we talking about when we say three phase? Like my motors and things run on three phase. Yeah. Well... Here's why. Because when we connect between uh, the peak of the black and the neutral, that's 120 volts. Uh, and we can do the same at any color. The peak of the red to the neutral is 120 volts. The peak of the blue to the neutral is 120 volts. But we'll notice that this electricity, it's AC current, alternating current, it's turning on and turning off at a rate of 60 times per second in the U.S., okay, 60 hertz, right? Mm -hmm. Well, these phases do not happen simultaneously. They happen uh, at, at time intervals. And so we can see that in order to connect between, let's say, the, in this case, the red and the blue, I can't get the full peak, which would mean 240. So where these two intersect would give me a uh, voltage of 208. So basically, if we look at any of the highest points that we can meet on any two phases, so our, our voltage from phase to phase is 208, and our voltage from phase to neutral is 120. Okay. And that's, uh, that's, the, basic, that's the basics of three-phase versus single-phase. 
So when it, when a person has a the two hundred eight, is that only uh, that only that happens in three phase? It does not happen in uh, single phase or well in two phase. Correct, because in single phase, like our two hundred forty, uh, then we have you know opposing phases where they, they are at one hundred eighty degrees, and we have more. So yeah, so you have two hundred forty from peak to peak, uh, and. And but you can't ever get peak to peak at two at, at in three phase. The most you can get is two hundred eight. Is there a, a a piece of? I mean, is it like all three phase only works up to that two hundred uh, two hundred eight uh, volt volts, or is it something that a lot of things will work on two hundred forty or two hundred eight? Mm. There are some pieces of gear that will work on both, and it comes down to what the piece of gear is. For example, I have some follow spots where there are internal jumpers you can move to go from 240 to 208, you know, basically transformer taps. Uh, however, like my chain motors, they have to be three-phase, uh, and, and that's a whole different, really, now mm -hmm. we're getting into really a much different thing we're talking they about. Exist. That's really what I'm after, is, is that there are things yeah. that could. Yeah, there are things that can. Um, there are things that can. Yeah, uh, I, I, th I think it's a it's a dangerous area to try to give simplified answers to. Mm -hmm. And I know that people come to the show to learn, and I love that. I think what I would say is this answer isn't the only answer. It's not the end of the answers. It's the beginning of looking for more if you need to. Right. Uh, in other words, don't pause this video right now and go plug something into two hundred eight. That's probably going to end poorly. Does a 208 connection, um, does it only exist when you can go into a board like what you've done? Or is it is there a wall outlet that says it's 208? Oh, there absolutely are, yeah. Uh, in fact, I, I've, I've had some venues install them. Uh, there are a couple different ones. I bet. Let me find some pictures. Um, uh, so, yeah, this one's probably good. Good picture. Mm -hmm. Day, I get I get your question, and we'll talk about that uh, in just a little bit. I'll bring that up to Ben after we get done with the picture here. Uh, so yeah, so like, okay, this is not the greatest picture, but here you can see uh, these circular connectors here. Yeah, kind of a twist lock. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that is a terrible color for annotation, standby. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it is a, it is exactly a twist lock connector. It is uh, an L twenty one thirty, the L for locking. Uh, and it is a 30 amp three phase. And you can see that we have one, two, three, four, five conductors, just like we do in my three phase connection. Sure. My three phases, my neutral, my ground. And electrically, that is exactly it. Uh, you know, so yeah, you could find these on a wall. Now, of course, if we look carefully at our drawing, you'll see some of the other examples I've got here. There's my, there's those 1450s. Uh, here we can see a, uh, you know, a four conductor single phase type connection, 240. And then we can see my, uh, you know, 520s, you know, down here, my standard NEMA conduct uh, uh, outlets, you know, that you would find in the house, you know. So it's it's not one of those situations that a person is going to be plugging in our dryer plug looking into the, raw, the uh, 208 uh, connection because they are very specific yeah, I mean, they shouldn't fit, you know, yep. I think is the, is the moral of the story. And here's another one. This is very common in, uh, in oops, not that one. Uh, well, here we go. Uh, again, this is, I'm stealing from a PowerPoint that I made years ago, but this is another very common uh, three-phase connection we find mm -hmm. uh, in venues, so. Nice. So for most of us, we're going to be running into situations where we have our typical our typical wall outlets that would be in a house or even a, a school, small business, whatever, that are running our 110 volt items. But even within that, there are some variations. Yeah, and I think it, it you know, as I, as I was closing the PowerPoint, I saw another slide that I put in there that I think this just seems like a really good time to uh, mention it. <laughs> uh, one, like you said, you know, well, what if I plug into there, this, that, whatever. I don't think you should ever plug into something without knowing what it is. Mm-hmm. I think that, you know, uh, if and if you're not comfortable taking the necessary steps to find out what it is, get a qualified person who is. It's a simple answer. It doesn't, right. you know, it doesn't mean you're stuck. Just go find somebody who's got a level of comfort that, you know, a, a licensed electrician or something that can say, yes, this is this. There are also instances where things are not wired correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, they should be. Uh, but are you willing to risk your gear or your life on that? I'm not. Yeah. Uh, 
and I'm a, I'm a very, you know, comfortable person around electricity. I'm a very smart person. I have a Minnesota electrical contractor's license, you know, I, I so I still test things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this slide here, I think is really worth noting. I think some things you absolutely should own, uh, you know, a, a multimeter for sure. I think that's a, just a really good piece of gear. You can stick it in there and figure out, do I have 120 volts from my hot leg or my phase to neutral? Do I have the same to the ground so I know my ground is good? Do I have zero volts between my ground and my neutral? Is this thing wired the way I expect it to be? Sure. Uh, of course, this is really essential tool uh, for any outlet. Just a really great way to see, you know, is this outlet wired correctly? And you'll be stunned at how many are not. Mm-hmm. Of course, while doing that, uh, I think, uh, you know, some safety glasses are a really good idea. Uh, you know, just in case you accidentally touch something you didn't want to, you could have, uh, you know, an arc and that could cause, uh, you know, some, you know, debris or, you know, plasma or sparks to, to come flying at your face. And, you know, uh, I mean, again, shouldn't happen, but safety glasses are cheap and easy to put on. Mm -hmm. And maybe a set of, uh, you know, non-conductive gloves. I don't know. You know, um, anyway, just just wanted to mention that's kind of how we get to that answer. The little outlet tester, that's a no brainer. They're like five bucks and doesn't take a rocket scientist degree to use one. You know, just plug it in. And if the lights light up the way it says they're supposed to, then that outlet is wired correctly. So this kind of fits into Dave's uh, day had a question about if there's anything that is out there that would allow a person to tell if two outlets that are on a wall or in an, a space are on the same circuit. So there are. Uh, they don't work very good in my experience. Mm. Uh, there's what's called circuit sniffers, snurkit snippers, snurkish, uh, snurker snickers. Yeah, it's easy snurkish to say snickers. before. <laughs> Basically, what we're trying to do is, you know, you would you would put a, a device in one outlet and then a test probe in another outlet, or go to the breaker panel, and it's basically looking to see, you know, is that carried along the same circuit you know mm -hmm. sometimes it'll use tones and things or whatever the problem is when wires travel parallel to each other uh in a conduit or in a wall they they generate a magnetic field that inducts itself in an adjacent wire so uh -huh. you could get false readings you absolutely do get false readings mm -hmm. all the time so um some are better than others just like anything in the world right uh in my experience I mean, you know, I know this, you're not going to like this answer, but in my experience, again, nothing beats having a, a, a licensed electrician go through and label those outlets. Yeah. You know, even within our building, we have many of the receptacles labeled as to the panel number, uh, you know, the circuit number. Um, now, of course, there's another surefire way to find out, you know, flip off a breaker and go see which outlets are dead. Mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, pretty much you have to also flip the breaker back on and verify that outlet came back on too, though, because it could just be dead for some other reason. You know, if you don't, if it's not your building and you don't know that, that life can get hard quick that Very way. Very much so. Yeah. The, uh, the little, that little uh, tester you had that you showed basically if the uh, outlet was wired correctly, I've seen where mm -hmm. some of those have the ability to test the breaker. What are they doing when they're testing the breaker with those? Well, usually it's not testing the breaker. It's usually testing a GFCI, which is a ground fault circuit interrupter. Okay. And the picture that I showed is a is just that. Uh, and 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 the reason they're not typically testing the breaker is uh, is the answer to your question. What's it doing? Basically, in order to test a breaker. Uh, you would short that uh, hot conductor, you know, right to to neutral or ground and generate an infinite amount of current simultaneously, which would trip the overcurrent protection device, which is a fancy word for a breaker. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, hey, that's more than 20 amps. I got a trip. However, as we just talked about with the uh, uh, DeLorean, I almost said Mandalorian. Wow. Mm, can you tell where my mind is Yeah, at? exactly. Uh, as we talked about with the DeLorean and Doc Brown, uh, you know, when we generate a lot of current, we generate heat. So that would be somewhat dangerous there. Um, and, and you probably don't want to start shorting out circuits just to trip breakers to find out. So, that, so the switch wouldn't do that. However, what it does do when it trips a GFCI, that's a very different thing. Uh, GFCI is basically monitoring to make sure that the current that comes, uh, you know, from the hot conductor leaves through the neutral conductor and we don't have leakage to ground you know it's basically saying is my is you know is is my you know all my current going where it's supposed to go you know 
uh, and uh, you know I don't have any problems there. Sort of my simplified way of explaining a GFCI. Sure. So by diverting some of that current, uh, you know, or some of that voltage rather, um, I guess it would also be current. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it trips the GFCI. It doesn't take very much. So, which would still be a trip to the breaker box to reset it. Uh, no, it's probably going to be the GFCI on the wall. Oh, on so the like wall. Okay. Yeah, you know, like a, let me. I bet I got a picture of a GFCI in this presentation. I feel like that's something I definitely would have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, just look. This presentation I made in 2013, so it's been a minute. Yeah, um, yeah, ten years. Uh, so bear with me. Oh, I got MOVs in here. Well, good for me. All right. Um, <laughs> they probably don't play anymore. That's the. No, no, no. Uh, metal oxide varistor, not an not oh, a movie oh. file. Oh, that's good. Okay. A metal oxide varistor is what's inside most of your surge suppressors. Uh, uh, but uh yeah i digress all right so let's see uh yeah so we never ever want to do that by the way we never want to get rid of the uh, ground pin uh that safety ground exists to uh, so don't use that first of all uh for the reason that most djs would use these things that's illegal actually believe it or not it's actually a law against that but never mind that the cops aren't going to arrest you they i mean probably more likely you're going to create yourself a problem potentially a life-ending one so don't do that so uh this is a gfci and this is oh i bet you can't even see my screen can you no no you gotta you gotta share it oh goodness i gotta back all this up all right hang on just talking to myself all right can you see it now there we go yep oh and there, there's the so, that's why you're talking about a plug with the ground pin broken yeah, up. so don't ever never do that and don't use a cord that looks like that um more to the point uh i can't uh i, can't I actually I actually had to repair one of those and put a new end on a cord that was one of a very expensive cord that the end broke off and uh when i ironically when i was going to go and wire the new one the uh, mm -hmm. uh the wires uh and i don't know where it came from but they uh the the uh the white and the uh, black wire were wired backwards but yet they oh. functioned properly they would just they just had connected them backwards and i went and i connected the first time and then i decided to just double check with that little uh little plug-in uh, uh three light device and it was showing that those two are wired backwards but they were wired properly so well, we'll notice there's different sizes on here mm -hmm. uh and, and they will work uh you know and, and you know sometimes you look at like a computer power power supply may not be polarized it may not have a ground it may not be polarized you know it doesn't it, it doesn't and then that's a whole other nuanced thing like you know we can get away with that like double insulated tools or something you know but anyway uh these are polarized so that you don't get them backwards when it matters mm -hmm. But this is the thing I was saying, you just don't want to use. Uh, don't use one of these circuit cheater things uh, because many times we're not using it for its intended purpose, which is actually to try to create a ground path uh, in a ungrounded circuit, which by the way, I think the National Electric Code made that uh, a change in like 1967 or eight or nine or something. So it's been a long time, bottom line, you know, uh, but don't ever use this to lift a ground. And by the way, that's the part that's illegal. If you read the National Electric Code, it literally says that it's illegal to lift a ground. And it also says that an objectionable current, i.e. a buzz, is not a sufficient reason to do it. <laughs> so, uh, but again, I don't think the cops are going to come bust down your door. If you do this, it's a better than good chance you're going to uh, potentially get seriously hurt or hurt somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not going to work the way you intended it to. Sure, the buzz goes away, but so does your protection. So, very, yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Back to the PowerPoint. So here's our GFCI. So here we can see, and again, you can see a little bit better uh, here that this slot is taller than this one. Uh, so you know, the the smaller one is the black wire. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my GFCI. So if I was to push the the test button on my GFCI tester it would trip this uh, and I would have to push this reset button. And these also typically have a test button built right in. So we wouldn't have to use that little circuit tester to do that. Um, and you can see a little closer test and reset uh, there. But uh, now, this ben, hang on. Yeah, okay, there, there's a difference. I'm seeing a difference between this one and one you just showed. Yes, What what is that difference? What, why does one of them have a weird looking there's one of them that's white and it's got a T in essence, a T-shaped hole. 
Ah, well, so what we can see is these uh, these are vertical slots only. That's a NEMA 515, so that means that is a 15 amp rated receptacle. This one has a horizontal and a vertical slot. This picture is just rotated uh, to show this label, but uh, that would be a 20 amp. But we can also, of course, plug a 15 into a 20. Can't plug a 20 into a 15, but we can plug a 15 into a 20. Okay. So that's why. And this white is actually just because it's a tamper-resistant outlet. Um, but this one's also showing us that there is no equipment ground, which means that uh, this is actually... Uh, whoops, that's not what I want to do. This uh, is not grounded, uh, but because it's a GFCI, we can use that to uh, protect ourselves in situations where we don't have a ground uh you know we can we can use that and there are portable gfcis that you can buy which was the uh, next slide or next uh, animation we saw this is a portable gfci we can plug in to something that doesn't have an equipment ground and give us some protection mm -hmm. uh because again that's the whole point is uh trying to keep yourself from uh you know becoming the path of least resistance to ground that's sure it's a good way to um, find out if there's a god or not so <laughs> Um, uh, anyway, uh, now, now they've moved to things like arc, arc fault breakers and all kinds of stuff like that, that were probably not, you know, aren't relevant to what we're talking about with DJs here. So, so let's jump back to that 20 amp, uh, the 20 amp outlet. Are there pieces of gear that have a plug-in that would utilize that or need or have that requirement compared to being able to run just on a 15 amp? Absolutely. Any device that draws more than 15 amps, because if you plug it into a 15 amp breaker, it's going to trip it. It's just that's just fact. 15 amps, 1800 watts. So uh, there are devices that draw more and uh, they'll have uh, plugs that basically prevent you from doing something like that. And, you know, the plug right away says, hey, I'm a 20 amp plug. I need to get plugged into something that can handle 20 amps of current. Mm -hmm. uh, now, for example, let's say you buy a 20 amp power conditioner. Well, the power conditioner itself has a very, very low draw. It, it's really, its job is to condition and distribute power to things downstream. So that power conditioner is going to have a 20 amp plug on it simply because its output capacity is 20 amps. So anything that gets plugged into it could be up to 20 amps. Uh, and so there are times when you say, well, I'm not really using 20 amps and I need to plug this into a 15 amp outlet. There are adapter cables that are a 20 to 15 uh, that you can that you can use when you know that your current will not exceed 15 amps. Sure. But yeah, there's there's all kinds of there are amplifiers and things that require more than 20 amps to operate uh, at, at their optimal output. So they come with different cords. So um, you know. needing more than 20. I mean, what's what's the next step that we may run into when it comes to an outlet that produces more amperage for us? Probably a single phase 30. Okay. You know, a 30 amp, and then we can move on up, right? And there are amplifiers that will even run on 208, uh, you know, and we can get into, you know, significant amounts of power, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of why, you know, if, if you see these amplifiers that say, oh, it's 10,000 watts and it's 120 volts, like, nah, I call BS. <laughs> Only if lightning hits it, and then it's going to go to 1955, you know. <laughs> and but it's gone. It's like, oh, it's going to go, it's going to go somewhere besides 1955. We were going to have some great sound tonight, but our sound system, part of it's in 1955. Yeah, it's also going to be really loud for about that long. You yeah, know? That's but. great. So, we, so we've got a variety of different uh, amperages. Uh, the outlets, of course, kind of tell us a little bit about that. But is it the outlet that is really dictating as far as is the, the amperage that is available? Or is it going to be more of the breaker that is the limiting factor when if it's wired properly? Well, the breaker is the right answer here. I mean, you know, certainly the uh, the current carrying capacity of the outlets themselves probably doesn't differ greatly between, you know, certainly between like a 15 and a 20. Internally, they're probably identical in terms of their ability to carry current. They could probably carry both more, more than, you know, 20 amps before that brass would melt or, you know, whatever, right? I mean, you so it's not like the outlet itself is is the uh, literal weak link in the chain. It's just the delivery point and the shape of which tells you what the breaker is. Uh, the breakers, of course, have a rating, uh, and then of course there you know we can't take a 15 amp outlet and go stick a 30 amp breaker on it because that would exceed the wiring capacity and those other things. It's it's really the whole thing, I guess, sure. is what I'm trying to say. Kind of. 
took the long road to get there, but it's, it's all of these things. Mm -hmm. We don't want mismatched parts. Uh, you know, now we can put 15 amp receptacles on a 20 amp circuit, uh, because you would not draw more than 20 amps from a 15 amp receptacle. Uh, it's the devices that are being presented that create the current draw. Okay. Uh, but conversely, we would not put a 30 amp receptacle on a 15 amp breaker because any 30 amp device would cause that 15 amp breaker to trip. Mm -hmm. So I guess the short answer is it's the breakers, you know, uh, but it, it really ought to go hand in glove all the way down the line. And that would, and, and that would include having the proper, the proper wire to handle the amperage that would be potentially drawn from the, uh, the power uh, box uh, that we have here. Hundred percent, and this is all fairly, you know, normal workaday stuff. For yeah. Electric. They, the, the National Electric Code has tables and definitions, uh, you know, for the size of a conductor based on the amperage, and there's also D ratings for temperature and that sort of thing, you know, because it's all of these things. It's not just the wire; it's the insulation. Obviously, we, you know, we even if the copper wire doesn't melt, but the insulation, you know, degrades or melts off. Now you have a real problem. Problem, right? Sam. So, uh, the National Electric Code, by the way, is published by the NFPA, and their entire purpose in life is protecting people and property, and it's to prevent fires. Uh, now, if there's any electricians that watch our show, they're probably going, "Yeah, oh, geez, Ben, you're really uh, simplifying this and, you know, kind of giving a kindergartner's explanation. Right. That's what we have. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, but I think they would tell you that, you know, this is all – pretty well defined there isn't any guesswork at this point you know so, yeah they've done the math in essence for us and we just uh, that's why we hire professionals to wire our offices and houses absolutely Let's, and why you should use uh you know properly wired ul listed uh or other you know some other uh, testing laboratory li listed equipment but you know i don't you know i'm not a fan of the the, the the you know kind of figuring it out on your own thing you know the stakes are just too high you know, mm -hmm. yeah, failure can be catastrophic, and that's not a not a good thing. Right. Uh, I've seen people talking about uh, electric uh, over the weekend here, and they were wanting to calculate exactly how much draw that their system has. And they were going to add everything up, and then they were okay. I know I've got a 15 amp outlet that I'll be mm -hmm. plugging into, and whatever whatever their total amount. Uh, really, uh, my question is, okay, so we have a 15 amp breaker in the box. Is there could there yep. be some potential line loss as it runs from my breaker box, you know, up the wall, across the ceiling, you know, to the other end of this building? It's about an eighty, probably an eighty to eighty-five foot run of electric uh, wire before it hits that outlet over there. Would there be the potential that there's line loss and that I really truly am maybe not getting fifteen amps at that outlet? I might be getting fourteen amps, as an example. Well, it's it, it's. It's actually volt drop that becomes a cause for concern. Okay. Uh, the resistance affects the voltage, but the voltage affects the amperage because of Ohm's law, like we talked about, uh, which we can kind of go back and take a look at here to answer that question a little more. Uh, but again, the math on this is all done. If it was done properly, they, they call it the point of utilization. So meaning where you plug into should deliver sufficient voltage. Okay. And in order to equal a certain amount of wattage, like we figured out with our 1.21 gigawatts, that uh, if our voltage drops, then our amperage must go up. So in essence, you know, what you're saying could be the case just in a different way. It's not that the amperage isn't available, it's that you actually need more of it. So a device that uh, at, you know, 120 volts needs 10 amps at 100 volts now needs, you know, maybe a little more than 12. I, just, I didn't really hmm. do the math. Okay. But, you know, because in order to equal that power, uh, so we're just that much closer to tripping a breaker because it's amperage, not voltage that trips a breaker. And amperage is the flow, the, the, the rate of flow of, electri of, of electricity, whereas voltage is kind of like uh, water pressure. You know, it's there whether you use it or not. Mm -hmm. You know, when you turn the faucet on, then the water flows, and that would be similar to like the flow of electricity with the amperage. Sure. And then I guess we could think about wattage as sort of like the total amount of water over a given amount of time. But so the analogy kind of broke down. Yeah, anyway. it, 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 yeah, it works for a bit. And then it kind of drifts off into you know, the middle of the pond and we wonder what's going on. Let me find this chart I have. It's called Ohm's Wheel. Um, and it shows the relationship of all of these things. 
uh, relative to each other. And I think that'll help us to answer our draw question as well. As well. So in order to not trip breakers, what we're really worried about is amperage. And uh, here we can see, you know, the relationship for amperage is power, which is watts, and electromotive force, which is volts. So that way I can figure out in order, uh, you know, if my, if my gear is measured in wattage, like let's say I've got a, you know, 500 watt lamp, you know, right? I don't know, I'm just trying to think of, you know, easy math. Let's do, let's do something really easy. It's divisible by, uh, you know, by 120. So let's say I've got a 600 watt lamp there you go. Uh, and I've got 120 volts of power. It's going to be five amps, okay? You know, because five times 120 equals uh Oh, yeah. Yeah, five times one twenty. That you go six hundred. Yeah, it's been a day. I'll tell you yeah, what. Yeah, I'm still trying to calculate gigawatts. Anyway, so, uh, so that's what you know. We're saying, okay, you know, so like in 120 volts, 15 amps equals 1800 watts, right? You know, 20 amp breaker at 120 volts equals 2400 watts. So uh, that's one way I could I could figure this out. Now, something else we need to think about is fuse ratings on our gear are the max current before that fuse fails. Mm -hmm. That's not what your gear is going to use all the time. And of course, we did a show years ago on amplifiers and how a thousand watt amplifier does not actually draw a thousand watts out of the wall, you know? Uh, so I would strongly recommend people to go back and watch that show um, because, you know, otherwise you're going to overcalculate, which is better than under calculating, but you're going to feel like you need more power than you really do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we will see speakers that'll say they draw one or two amps, you know, uh, and, and, you know, you might say, well, but it's a 2000 watt speaker, you know, so I need, you know, nearly 20 amps. No, you really don't, you know, cause you're not really, unless, unless you're going to absolutely rail that thing. Uh, but also there's things like crest factor and audio, you know, and, and how much power are we drawing over an average amount of time? So, Anyway, conversely, if we wanted to calculate for something else, if we want to calculate for watts, we come over here to this side of the wheel, and uh, here we can see that, you know, volts times amps equals watts. Mm -hmm. So that's where we get that equation of 120 volts times my, you know, 5 amps equals 600 watts, right? So It's a lot of math. It is, and it's, it's not that bad, and there are, there are apps for it, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, I think it's just really good to know because... I, I have an ohm calculator on my phone, and I don't know if I've ever even opened it. I think it's one of the things that it's nice to know there's a relationship, and once you play with it a little bit and understand how they how they function, then they, that they are connected to each other, and and how that uh, goes. I think it's all very much relational. You know, yeah. we were talking about uh, just to go back to this for a quick second. We were also talking about the relationship of resistance in here. You know, to say well. You know, we've got 300 million volts of lightning uh, we're trying to deliver to DeLorean, but we're doing it over the steel cable. And what's the resistance to that? What is the actual capacity? What could we actually really deliver mm -hmm. to the car? You know, now when you're playing with lightning, I think, you know, you can just sort of round a lot of things off. Yeah, you have 300 so. million volts, you, get, you know, <laughs> but, you know, uh, there are some conversations about why lightning isn't uh, necessarily viable as a, uh, energy source we can harness mm -hmm. too. And one of the challenges is that lightning gets delivered so quickly. There's so much power that gets delivered so quickly it's almost impossible to capture and store. Yeah. So anyway. Unless yeah. you're Doc Brown and well, he didn't he didn't store it. He used it. Well, I mean, he used he it. Went, he went at the time just like that. Yeah, so you know that's true. Hey. He didn't store it, so we're still back to that. And he one. didn't use a lot of it. You know, again, uh, you know, uh, three hundred million volts, you know, three times ten to the eighth power, we only need four amps, you know? So And he might have had just a little more than that coming down that wire. Yeah, why you wanted it or not, you know. <laughs> Ah, excellent. Well, wonderful. Thank you, Ben. Uh, some good, good information there uh, for those who are out there trying to figure out, you know, what they need for plugging into the walls and such that uh, will kind of give you a little, a little food for thought with that. Uh, for those of you out there uh, up next here in about 10 minutes, they will be in the chill room, djntv.com slash chill. And you can go out there and uh, the guys are going to be recording a Tuesday night music show and then hanging out and chatting afterwards. So you guys can have some fun with that. And and Ben, you've got another big day tomorrow in the big city of Grand Forks. Yeah, I better not have another power outage. Uh, yeah. which, 
I, I think I don't think that electrician is coming back in the building. I think he uh, I think he understands. I think he was probably sufficiently embarrassed when he found out what he had done. I, you know, I mean, there are, you know the people that are in this event are senators and generals and uh, you know presidents of corporations. Uh, so I, I think he uh, probably is not coming back for a few days. He's going to make sure the air is clear probably but, <laughs> before. Uh, uh, but, you know, I just wanted to say, too, to our viewers, first of all, thanks for watching and thanks for the great questions. But, two, you know, a self-plug here for rental effects, but I'm not the only guy in our building by a long shot that knows these things. We've mm -hmm. got some extraordinary people on our team. Uh, and I think that separates us from a lot of the uh, dot-coms, as it were. You know, you can buy gear a lot of places, but, uh, you know, I, I think that we bring a lot more to the, uh, to the table. So even if the gear you're, you know, buying isn't power-related, remember – you know, your purchases help keep us all employed and keep us there to serve you when you need us. So, uh, you know, we appreciate the support and uh, hope you'll continue to uh, offer that so we can continue to continue to work at the whole effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I and mean, there, there are some aspects of it. I mean, truly, when we start talking about how many lights can I plug into a circuit? If I go, and I I think I asked about one of the times that Sam and I were talking a little bit about it, about uplights and charging them. You know, and making sure that we were doing it and doing it in a safe manner. And that's, there's important things. It isn't the, oh, well, that outlet strip's got 24 outlets. That means you can plug 24 things into it. You know, it's not that all the time. No, nope. kind of like, uh, kind of like a checkbook. Just because you have checks left doesn't mean you got money left, you know? So, what? It doesn't. Oh, boy, don't I know that. Uh, doesn't work don't that I way. know that. <laughs> doesn't work that way? Oh. Yeah. I tried that one on my parents when I was a kid. I, I wanted something for Christmas, and we, were, of course, didn't have, you know, we didn't have a lot of money at all. But anyway, I didn't understand. I really didn't understand. As mm -hmm. a kid, I was like, but you have check blanks. And my mom's like, yeah, it don't work like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I remember having that uh, similar conversation at one time with my, back with my parents. So I think everyone does at some point in time. So, Ben, we got to jump. Thank you once again, and thank you guys for watching. We will be back again next week. You can catch, all, catch the shows on DJ and TV. Good night, everybody. Uh -huh.